So a lad on subject? Okay, so are you filming? Yeah. Okay, page 1020, 1020, section 35.1. Um, we're talking about the digestive system today, and yes, um, digestive system a lot of fun. It's how you take in food and break it down and take what's good out of the food and use it and then excrete the rest of it as a waste product. So I don't know if you know this, but you have a tube that goes all the way from your mouth all the way to your butthole. Nice. And the food goes all the way through it. And the food looks different when it comes out than when it goes in because it had all the good stuff taken out of it. And only the stuff you don't really need comes out. So, when you eat this girl's eating an apple right here, the apple's broken down by the teeth, and you have salivary glands that squirt saliva onto the food, and so there's actually two types of digestion that goes on. There's chemical digestion, which are enzymes that are in the saliva, little, little mo molecules start individually breaking down the molecules of the food and uh, that's called uh, chemical digestion. And then you have mechanical digestion is the actual gnashing up, mashing up of the food by the teeth. That's mechanical. And so you chew it up, you spray all the saliva on it, and that also moistens the food and it allows it to be able to go down the esophagus um, and toward the stomach. From Yes. Now there are four types of teeth. You have incisors in the front. Canines are the sharper teeth a little further back. Premolars further back than that. And molars even further back than that. Four types. Incisors, canines, premolars, and molars. Here's a little video footage on teeth. The teeth and jaws have the job of breaking food down into fragments. And the teeth have evolved different shapes for different tasks within the mouth. At the front of the mouth are incisors, with the job of holding food and cutting it into bite-sized chunks. <laughs> Further back are premolars and molars, the double teeth which grind and chew the food. We have 32 teeth, with the last ones appearing at the back when we're adults. That's why they're called wisdom teeth. incisors to the molars. There our jaw muscles can exert the maximum pressure. If necessary, we can generate a force of nearly 200 pounds with our jaw muscles, and our teeth are covered with the hardest substance in the body, tooth enamel. These forces are so strong that they could break the teeth. Fortunately, 
There are pressure detectors beneath the teeth that sense when the pressure is too great and stop the jaws closing any further. Huh. We said so we have uh, we can exert a pressure of 200 pounds. That's 200 pounds per square inch. Do you know what the uh, strongest what what mammal has the strongest teeth? Shark. Shark, not a mammal. Elephant. Hyena. Hyena can exert a pressure of 5,000 pounds per square inch. So, and that's enough to break bones in half. And that's what they do. They eat the marrow out of bones that have been left from kills from other animals. Now, as you're swallowing, the, uh, the food, when it goes down, there's actually a little flap of tissue here called the epiglottis that closes so that the food doesn't go down the windpipe and the food goes down the esophagus. The esophagus is like a, like a tube that uh, food will kind of move down and this tube is covered with muscle. And the muscle will squeeze right behind the food to push the food downward. And this, the muscle is so strong you could you could eat or drink standing on your head. Gravity wouldn't pull it back this way. The muscle's strong enough to force it against gravity. And the movement of the food through this tube, and by the way, this happens all the way through the tube. There are muscles that squeeze the food along. We have a name for that squeezing. It's called peristalsis. And here it shows you the walls of the tube squeezing on the sides pushing the food downward, that's called peristalsis. And I got a couple of videos showing you that. A lot of good videos this chapter. Digestion begins as food is chewed and mixed with salivary enzymes that digest starch. Food then passes through the esophagus to the stomach. Food is propelled through the digestive system by waves of muscular contraction called peristalsis. Splash. Is that a good video? That was a good video. I think you just spoiled. I think the guy was just saying it. When you swallow, the tongue pushes the food back into the throat or pharynx. The pharynx leads to two passages one to the stomach and the other to the lungs. When we swallow, a valve momentarily closes the opening to the lungs, so that food must go to the esophagus. Occasionally, if we talk or laugh while eating, food does go down the wrong passage, blocking the flow of air to the lungs. If the passage is not cleared through coughing or other means, we choke. Food passes from the oral cavity to the stomach through the esophagus, pushed quickly along by wave-like contractions of muscle. This kind of muscular action is called peristalsis. The food passes through another valve to enter the stomach, where it is stored temporarily. So what if, like, water or something gets down in your lungs? Um, you'll either cough it up, um, or if it's a big enough piece of something, you, it can cause you to choke It'll and you walk. have to do the uh, Heimlich maneuver and get it out. But if it's small enough, it'll just, it'll, there are little hairs on your trachea that push it up back up to your throat. I think you said, what if water gets in your lungs? Well, water is just small particles. So the same thing, it'll cause you to cough. You could, it could, I mean, if you were drowning, it would go all the way down in your lungs, and that could end up killing you. Um, so here are all the different parts, the esophagus here, and then there's the stomach. Thank you. We'll talk about the liver and gallbladder and what they do in a minute. They help with the digestion process. And there's another one called the pancreas that sits behind the stomach. Oh, that also releases digestive enzymes, this yellow one here. And then there's the small intestine is this thin tube, and then the large intestine is this thick tube, and then the rectum holds the doo-doo. And then the anus is at the bottom where it comes out. 
Food moves down the esophagus by way of peristalsis, a series of involuntary smooth muscle contractions along the walls of the digestive tract. The contractions occur in waves. First, circular muscles relax and longitudinal muscles contract. Then circular muscles contract and longitudinal muscles relax. So next you have the stomach. I won't make you read that. I'll just talk about it a little bit. Here's the stomach. The stomach is kind of a J-shaped bag that holds the food for up to four or five hours. It depends on what you eat. Some things last stay in the stomach longer than others. Um, it can hold. It can stretch. The stomach can stretch. It's kind of like a balloon. And uh, the more you fill your stomach up, the more you stretch it. It's like take a balloon that doesn't, it's hard to blow up and you stretch it back and forth, it stretches a little easier. But some people have a stomach that can stretch a whole lot and that, like those champion hot dog eaters, they can fit a whole lot of food in the stomach. Um, the, uh, the stomach has muscles in its walls and can again squeeze the food along. It has little ridges and stuff like that and the stomach will release acid onto the food, hydrochloric acid. It has a very low pH and it will cause the, the stomach, the, anything living that's in your food to be killed. And you say, well, what am I not, I'm not eating living things. You are, even if you take a bite of a sandwich, there's millions and millions of bacteria on the sandwich, little microscopic organisms. And they all have to be killed or you'll get food poisoning. So that's what the hydrochloric acid does. The stomach also releases a substance called pepsin that breaks down the proteins in the food. So it, any proteins in your, in your uh, meals are broken down by this pepsin molecule. So that's more chemical digestion. And the muscles, by the way, the muscles of the stomach cause the stomach to churn and move a lot. And this is a good video showing you how that stomach moves. Watch the stomach down here. Here comes food in. Splash! Contractions of the stomach's muscular walls mix food with gastric juices. Look how much it moves. So it really what it does? Yeah. That's why your stomach will growl. If that's moving around, it'll make noise. Why does it growl when you're hungry? Sometimes it does. I don't know. Guy yeah, eats and explodes. Definitely. You want to see a stupid video? Yes. Why would no one see a guy back. explode and do this over here? <laughs> That sucks. So if you eat more, that pushes the stuff that you ate earlier okay. in front of it, you see? Okay. Yeah. And so it's kind of like a conveyor belt there. What, what goes in here pushes everything else. Now watch this. And watch it for about one hour. We can see the effect pepsin has on protein. Okay, that's a piece of meat. And they put it in pepsin, gastric juice. Gastric juice is, is stomach acid and, and pepsin. What, what's pepsin salt? So, what they've done, is, what you see here is there's still the, this is the part that wasn't in the, in the gastric juice. You see the fat is still left, but all the protein is gone. It digested the protein and broke it down. Intense. So that's what happens in your stomach. All the protein is broken down. Or a good amount of it, not all of it. 
Isn't that cool? It was a great video. Well, here's what it looks like inside. This video, they actually take cameras and feed them down on wires into people's digestive systems so you can see inside the <coughs> digestive system. The raw material comes in many shapes, sizes, and tastes. In a lifetime, the average person consumes 8,000 eggs, half a ton of cheese, 6,000 loaves of bread, 1,000 gallons of milk, 24 pigs, and a ton of fruit. Swallowing starts the food machine. As we swallow, a reflex action stops us from breathing. The soft palate is raised to prevent food from backing up into the nose. An elastic flap behind the root of the tongue, called the epiglottis, bends backwards to close off the larynx, the air passage to the lungs. The mouthful is steered safely into the esophagus, a muscular tube with a lining very like skin. Waves of contractions pass along its walls, propelling the contents with such force that you could drink standing on your head. These contractions, called peristalsis, are the start of an ever-rolling conveyor belt that carries food and drink through the entire process of digestion. Just the thought of food is enough to make your mouth water. Three pairs of salivary glands produce two pints of saliva every day. It pours through miniature fountains from under the tongue to lubricate the food and make it easier to swallow. It also keeps the mouth and tongue moist. Saliva really starts gushing when there's food in the mouth or even when you think of something tasty. From here, the food has a twisting 36-foot journey through the digestive system. It will be subjected to physical and chemical attack as the body systematically dismantles the complex ingredients of food into the basic nutrients it can utilize. Chewing starts the assault. The mouth is loaded with 32 teeth designed to mill, cut, and tear. The white surface of the teeth, enamel, is the hardest substance in the body, as hard as glass. Yet it's a living tissue and can repair minor damage to its surface. As the teeth demolish the physical structure of solid food, saliva mounts a second attack. It contains two enzymes, chemicals that help pull apart the food's complex chemical structure. One of these enzymes breaks down starch molecules into sugar. To test this, chew something starchy for a minute or two and you can taste the result of this chemical reaction, a sugary sweetness in your mouth. The mouthful of food, or bolus, is squeezed down the esophagus, a journey of only three seconds. This is the gateway to the stomach, a valve at the bottom of the esophagus. Beyond is the inside of a muscular bag, about the size and shape of a boxing glove. The stomach is a food processor. It pulverizes what we eat, diluting or concentrating it, preparing it for the next stages of digestion. It's also a reservoir for holding food between meals. This cavern is the stomach at full stretch, at its maximum capacity of three pints. Strong acid pours in, attacking and breaking down food. Mysteriously, it remains safe from its own corrosive contents. The secret lies in its convoluted walls. They are covered with deep pits, each lined with microscopic cells. In a bizarre balance, some of the cells release hydrochloric acid, while their neighbors secrete a sticky mucus. 
This coats the stomach walls and protects it from self-destruction. The stomach lining pours out almost a gallon of gastric juice a day. Like saliva, these glands can start to water at even the thought of food. Good views of the inside of the body there. The cameras they have nowadays that they can put down into the system are pretty amazing. Okay, so now after the stomach, the food goes into what we call the small intestine. And so here's the esophagus, here's the stomach, here's the start of the small intestine. And this first part of the small intestine is kind of shaped like the letter C there. It's called the duodenum, but I don't think your book uses that word. It might. Anyway, at this point, the food is hit with secretions from two areas. From the liver and gallbladder and from the pancreas. They both squirt stuff into the small intestine that help break down the food. Um, you may have heard of the gallbladder. It's a, it's a little green bag and it holds a substance that we call bile. Bile is this green stuff. The bile is made by the liver. The liver makes bile. That's one of its jobs. Squirts the bile out. The bile is stored in the gallbladder. And whenever you eat, whenever food goes out of the stomach into the small intestine, there's some muscles around here that squeeze that bag and push the bile in. And the bile breaks down fats. Remember the fat that was left on the meat that, that wasn't digested completely in the stomach? That's digested here in the small intestine by stuff, by bile. Bile is squirted down here and digests the fat. And then this pancreas squirts six different digestive enzymes that break down all sorts of stuff. It breaks down sugars, it breaks down fats, it breaks down proteins, it breaks down nucleic acids, it breaks down everything. So the pancreas here is this huge digestive organ that helps break the food down. And so anything that coming out of the stomach is finished being digest, digested in the small intestine. Now, as this food moves through the small intestine, here's where all the nutrients get absorbed. Now that the food has been broken down into, into microscopic molecules, into the smallest parts that it can be broken down into. And if you look at the walls of the small intestine, it looks hairy. It looks like the surface of a carpet, if you look at it close enough. And the reason why is it's got all these little finger-like projections called villi. See they, look, see they look like hairs or fingers? And inside each villus, there are blood vessels and little, uh, th this green thing is a little vessel called a lymphatic vessel. But the blood vessels and the lymphatic vessels absorb all the nutrients from the food. The food molecules are so small, they can go right through these cells by diffusion into the bloodstream. So now your blood has the good stuff from the food. And the blood moves all around the body and will take these food particles anywhere in the body that's, that it's needed. All your cells need sugars for their mitochondrians, need glucose. Now, Graham, what's going on with you today? <coughs> Second time I've asked you. you got to come to school ready. Ready for learning. Not ready for sleeping. Ready, ready. Watch the small intestine do its work. The stomach contents pass through the pyloric sphincter to the small Sophie, intestine. Sophie, right up here. A duct from the gallbladder adds bile, which breaks up fat droplets. This duct is joined by one from the pancreas, which adds bicarbonate. That happened pretty quick. Watch the food coming out of the stomach. The small intestine. Watch. A duct from the gallbladder adds bile, 
which it breaks, breaks up fat droplets. Oh, this duct is joined by one from the pancreas, which adds bicarbonate to neutralize the acid, and adds enzymes, which, along with those from the intestines lining, complete digestion. Food is propelled through the digestive system by waves of muscular contraction called peristalsis. It's like a ride. Make Once digestive enzymes have broken large food molecules into small ones such as monosaccharides, amino acids, and fatty acids, absorption of these nutrients can occur. The lining of the small intestine has a great many projections called villi. The surface cells of the villi have many small projections called microvilli. These greatly increase the surface area for absorption. Each villus contains capillaries and a lymph vessel. The products of fat digestion enter the lymph vessel. All other nutrients enter capillaries. See the molecules just go right through into the blood. Blood leaving the intestine flows directly to the liver in the hepatic portal vein. In the liver, nutrients can be stored or converted to other molecules before release into the general circulation. Now this is an important part. This is the main function of your liver, this big brown organ, is that all the blood vessels that have absorbed food take the, the blood into the liver. And the liver inspects what has been absorbed. See, And if there's any poisons or anything bad, the liver will tear it apart so it's not so it doesn't kill you. So the liver is like the first line of defense for something bad that has been absorbed in the digestive system. Let me give you an example. In my Coke can here, there's water, there's sugar, good stuff. There's caffeine. Well, you know what? Caffeine's a poison. It's created by plants to keep insects from eating them. And an insect that eats a plant, a, a cocoa, a, a, like plant that makes caffeine will die. So how can we handle it? Well, we have a liver and the caffeine gets in our intestine and is pulled into the blood and the caffeine goes into the liver and the liver breaks the caffeine down a little bit so it's not so toxic. And we can handle it. And we love it. So our liver allows us to eat things that most animals can't handle. Here's, here's when they stake a little camera into the intestine. Here's what it actually looks like on the inside. To track where a straight tube, like a worm, we would have to be 30 feet tall. Instead, our intestines are neatly looped into coils to fit inside a convenient sized body. Peristalsis continues its conveyor belt role, moving the chyme out of the stomach through this tiny non-return valve. Each contraction forces less than a teaspoonful of chyme on into the top of the small intestine, the duodenum. Here, the inner surface of the gut changes to a moist velvety lining. It's specially designed to absorb the broken down constituents of food. These tiny finger-like projections called villi increase the area for absorbing nutrients. They give the lining of the small intestine an area ten times greater than the surface of your skin. Enough to carpet a living room. This is where nutrients pass from the intestine into the bloodstream. Each of the tiny villi contains a network of blood vessels which absorb glucose and amino acids, the building blocks of carbohydrates and proteins. Fat flows into tiny tubes in the villi. These connect to another of the body's plumbing systems, 
the lymphatic vessels, which eventually empty into the blood circulation. This dense network of microscopic tubes is wrapped around the small intestine to carry away the components of food. After we've eaten a heavy meal, blood floods to these capillaries from other parts of the body, leaving our muscles weak and our brains foggy. intestine right here. It's also called the colon. You ever heard the colon before? Yeah. A, a colonoscopy is when they stick a camera up your butt and look around the colon mm. with the camera. You can do this if you become a proctologist or an endo. Yeah, they do that to me all the time. <clears throat> well, here's how it works. The food that leaves the small intestine is just waste. There's not a lot of uh, nutrients left in it. It's all been absorbed. So the waste goes into the large intestine. Now there's still a lot of water in it. And the water has to be absorbed. So the walls of the large intestine absorb the water back. And so, so the, the material, is, the waste is concentrated. And finally, by the time it makes it all the way to the rectum, it's just stored there. Now, also living in the large intestine are bacteria. Trillions and trillions of bacteria live in the large intestine and they eat some of the stuff that we can't digest. And in return, they make for us two vitamins that we need, vitamin B and vitamin K. And I always remember that because Burger King, BK, Burger King gives you diarrhea. So I associate B and K with the large intestine. With diarrhea. With diarrhea, because see, diarrhea is if you get, if you ever get in it, uh, if ever something makes it through your stomach that's alive and starts multiplying in your small and large intestine, you get diarrhea. That's the body trying to push out the uh, bacteria that's invaded here, um, and it'll, it'll, so it'll make contractions real fast without absorbing any of the water back from the large intestine. Like that's what diarrhea is. What? Do you not like Burger King yet? No, I like Burger King. But it gives you diarrhea. But it's easy because it's vitamin B and K. That makes sense. It's uh, easy to associate. Oh, I thought you were saying it's actually. No. Um, the appendix, you may have heard of the appendix before. It's a little flap of tissue here that hangs off the colon. And in us, it's real tiny. In monkeys, it's huge. It's as big as the, the rest of the large intestine and it's for breaking down leaves. But apes quit eating leaves and the, the appendix got real small as apes evolved and eventually as humans evolved, the appendix is almost disappeared. Vestigial structure? It's a vestigial structure, do it, Drew. Hey, Troy, what do apes eat now? Apes eat fruit and meat. They eat meats. Yeah, they catch little animals. Now, what you're probably wondering is, Mr. Willis, what if you had no stomach? Well, you would have to ask God, the man with no stomach. Some of us live to eat. We all eat to live. For three years, Jonas Scott couldn't swallow a single bite of food, and it's a wonder that he's still alive. But thanks to one brilliant surgeon, Jonas is able to enjoy a meal just like anyone else. With one bizarre difference, his small intestine is attached directly to his throat. And in this exclusive home video, you're actually watching a mouthful of sandwich pass through his system. the story of Jonas Lonzel Scott, a 41-year-old father of two living in Ogden, Utah. Jonas didn't always wear his entrails where everyone could see them. His childhood was as happy, healthy, and normal as anyone could hope for. But the death of his mother sent Jonas into a spiral of depression that only grew worse as the years went by. In 1980, 
1988, Jonas divorced and was separated from his children. Hitting rock bottom, he decided to kill himself. Desperate, drunk, and despondent, he guzzled a deadly cocktail of industrial cleaning fluid. And then I just mixed the grill cleaner with some painkillers, and I drunk it, and I just fell flat to the floor. I could feel the burning sensation just going down, sinking down, burning everything up. But it was just too late then to, for me to do anything because I couldn't throw it up, I couldn't do anything. Jonas crawled outside to die while neighbors called the paramedics. I had burned all my insides out and the next day that I was in the hospital, they told me that they would have to do surgery or I would die. Jonas barely survived, but now life was almost worse than death. His esophagus, stomach, colon, and large intestine had been literally eaten away. His future was a nightmare. He wasn't able to swallow. His uh, throat ended in his neck, and if he were to uh, try to swallow, nothing would happen. He uh, wasn't even able to swallow his own saliva. He was being fed with a tube that went into the side of his intestine that liquid food was injected into. 1991, Jonas met with Dr. Charles James Eaton, a Salt Lake City microsurgeon. Eaton was his final hope. I was a bit pessimistic when I first met him. He'd been through a lot and he failed pretty much everything that had been offered to him. Dr. Eaton knew there was only one solution. In a radical procedure, Jonas would have his small intestine attached directly to his throat. Once again, Jonas Scott was staring into the face of death. He knew going into surgery that he could die as a result of the surgery, that it was a uh, big operation, that he'd be split from stem to stern, then he might not make it as a result of the surgery itself, but that was a chance he was willing to take. I just knew that he was going to make me eat again. I just knew it. Something just told me it's going to work this time. During a marathon 36-hour operation, a team of surgeons connected his small intestine directly to his throat. Dr. Eaton had the delicate task of removing a blood vessel from Jonas's leg and attaching it to the newly constructed swallowing tube. The blood vessels that go to the bowels are a certain length and they can't stretch the whole way. So what my job was to help restore the circulation to the part of the intestine that had been brought all the way up to his throat. The surgery was a success, but it left Jonas with this startling appearance. We decided to run his intestine in front of his breastbone because he had had problems with infection with one of his prior operations. I didn't want to have any problem with an infection being stirred up by going through that same area again. It's a little bit of a strange thing to do, but it worked for him. He actually moves the food along himself by physically pushing on the tube when it doesn't go down by itself. This is not trick photography. What you are seeing is food passing directly from Jonas's mouth toward his bowels. Because he has no stomach, the food passes through so quickly that his body has difficulty absorbing nutrients. I eat six times a day. Every two and a half to three hours I eat. And I start eating about 12 o'clock. And I don't stop eating till 10.30 at night. 10.30 at night is my last meal. And then I'll go to bed about 1.30 and I'm good till the next morning. Because he's also missing his colon and large intestine, there is nothing to slow down the process. If I'm eating light food, I would have to use the restroom oh, in about three to four minutes. But if I'm eating like potatoes and carrots, six or seven minutes. Despite that inconvenience, Jonas now relishes every bite and every moment of his life. He's been able to watch his children grow up and return the love of those family members who never left his side. You would not want to live like this. But I am happy because I'm able to eat again and I'm finally able to quote with it and I know this is what I have to do. And I am very pleased. <laughs> See? That's what happens if you have no stomach. Okay, isn't that fun? So, here's the dealio with this chapter.
Tonight, of course, you read page 1020 to 1024. They're very welcome to be a quiz tomorrow. We are skipping 35.2. That's about nutrition. We actually already talked about that some in chapter 7 or 8, something like that. All the organic molecules, you might remember. Um, so we're skipping 35.2. Tomorrow we do the endocrine system, which is 35.3. So, when you're studying for this test, don't worry about 35.2. That'll save you a little time and effort and money. Not money, it won't save you any money. Okay? Alrighty then. Willis, out.